Good afternoon, everyone. This is Gerard Robinson. Welcome to another session. This is a part of our regular series. And as you know, I bring together wonderful people from across the country. Today, on a Saturday, we're going to talk about the role of faith communities, of faith-based communities in criminal justice reform. And why are, we, why are we having this conversation today? First of all, this is Second Chance Month. Uh, it was created in 2017 with support from Prison Fellowship, but also members of Cong Congress, uh, particularly in the Senate, unanimously voted to support Second Chance Month. Uh, President Joe Biden, at the end of March, signed a proclamation also acknowledging uh, this as Second Chance Month. And as he said, it's really a time for us to get together to identify what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong in the criminal justice system, and particularly what can we do for people. Uh, we know that we have approximately 2.3 million people who are incarcerated uh, behind bars across the United States. We know that at least 40% of them are actually parents. We know that nearly 50% of the men and women who are there today, in fact, were the economic breadwinner for their home prior to incarceration. And we know there are a number of executive orders. We know there are a number of laws but we also have to take time to actually talk about faith leaders and the role they're playing right now in addressing criminal justice reform, which is why we're here today. I'm also a fellow of practice at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture here at UVA. And we were founded over 25 years ago by Dr. James Davison Hunter. And he published a wonderful book called To Change the World, The Irony, Tragedy, and Possibility of Christianity in the Late Modern World. And in this book, uh, he talks about the Clapton Circle, and it was a group of clergymen uh, between the 1790s, 1830s uh, in Britain who got together, who were involved in a number of crusades, whether it was going for the abolition of slavery, whether it was going to support charity schools. But people often overlooked it. They also talked about prison reform because they believed there was a role for faith communities in that. And what Dr. Hunter mentioned is when you get the people together, those who are cultural influencers, and surely those we have on the phone today are cultural uh, influencers, we can have a legitimate dialogue about what we can do to help people. So with that, I want to welcome my guests to uh, today's session. And what I'm going to do is just introduce everyone uh, in the order in which we've seen them on your screen, and then we'll get started. Let me first uh, introduce Tony Loudon, who is a pastor and who's also the former executive director of the Federal Interagency Council on Criminal Prevention and improving reentry. He's from Georgia. Uh, we've got uh, Pastor John Ponder, who's a founder and CEO of uh, Hope for Prisoners uh, in Nevada. We have Apostle Sharon Wallace, who's the pastor of uh, M5K Ministries International. She's also in Virginia with me, so good to have someone here from the home team. And we've got Bishop Ron Webb, who's the CEO and president of SEMO, uh, Christian Resource Center, and he's also a pastor. Um, I know only one of them personally. I now know all of them because of my connection with Tony. So welcome and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So first thing I like to do for those who are with us is to give them an opportunity to know about your personal journey to the point where you are right now. I'll save the questions about uh, your particular uh, work with criminal justice reform, but we're really interested in knowing more about who you are, where you grew up. Um, as people of faith, when did you receive your calling and how that leads you to this point? And so what I'm gonna do is uh, start off with uh, Apostle Wallace and say, who is Apostle Wallace? <laughs> Apostle Wallace is a servant leadership. God bless each and every one of you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am a homegrown Virginia girl. I uh, started off in an uh, engineering field and from there the Lord called me into ministry I spent quite a few years trying to renegotiate with God, as ridiculous as that sounds, <laughs> and finally accept the calling to serve in the community. And I am the mother of two beautiful daughters. We're going to go to uh, Bishop uh, Webb. What's, uh, who's Bishop Webb and what's your story? Yes. Hi, I'm Bishop Ron Webb, and I'm honored and elated to join you on this uh, phenomenal program on today um, from Southeast Missouri. Um, the beautiful show me state, as they say, and uh, started in ministry almost 38 years ago, uh, former athlete and, you know, come from a family of athletes. And so uh, just really had a great desire to reach out in our community and be a part of the solution instead of reciting problems. Did some coaching in the past. 
uh, accept my call in my freshman year uh, in college started preaching uh, on the basketball team. And, uh, and from that day to this day, still going forth in ministry and just reaching out and uh, touching lives is where our heart is today. Thank you. The, my former pastor, when I was uh, back in the 80s, going to Mary North Community Church was uh, uh, Pastor Billy Ingram, who also was called as a basketball player. Uh, <laughs> to play. and so uh, there's, there's, there's definitely a story, A.C. Green and others along the way. Yes. Let's go to you, Pastor. Uh, see, we do, Pastor Ponder. Let's uh, let's go to you. I think you're in Nevada. Yes, I certainly am. Uh, thank you for the uh, this opportunity. Looking very forward to having this conversation. Um, uh, John Ponder. I originally grew up uh, in New York. Uh, born and raised uh, in Brooklyn, spent a lot of time out in Long Island, uh, moved out to Las Vegas back in 1989. Uh, I am married. I have six children, uh, three of them grown and out of the house, and I have three little ones that are at home. Uh, I was called uh, to the ministry um, um, when I had a conversation with Jesus inside a prison cell many, many years ago. And out of that birth, my ministry called Hope for Prisons. We say that, you know, we're here uh, in Las Vegas and, you know, Las Vegas is, is known for Sin City, but we are turning this into Salvation City. <laughs> All right. Well, I see you're going to get some preaching going on. I'm going to maybe hoop a little bit, but I'm getting there. Look forward to hearing more about your story and thank you for opening up your personal life as well. Thank uh, you. All of us. Uh, last but not least, who's Tony? <laughs> Well, I'm just a little boy from North Philadelphia, one of the worst ghettos in America, and had an opportunity to uh, have a nana in my life that said, if you come to church, I'll bake you a banana pudding. <laughs> and going to church, chasing that banana pudding or chasing the, the opportunity to watch TV with the City Eagles or the, or the Phillies or the Sixers play on our TV in the living room, that was the sole purpose why I agreed to go to church for the sports and the banana pudding. That's where I met uh, my Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And ever since then, I've been what I call the awake Christian, where mm -hmm. God has opened my eyes to see the plight of men and women in my community, where men and women are going in and out of prisons, children are trapped in failing schools, poverty and economics uh, are just some of the worst in our nation, healthcare one of the worst in our nation. And so with that and being called into the ministry, have allowed me to always want to be the church outside the church, outside the walls. And that's why I do what I do, because I, I believe that we have a responsibility as servant leaders to do what God has called us to do, the mission of the church. Thank you. Well, just to follow up on my opening about the number of people, we know the statistics, but here are some bigger questions. You know, when we look at the 1970s and the prison population we had then, compared to 2021, over 800% increase for women. Uh, the number of men across the racial lines have, have increased. Uh, for those who have, Tony, you mentioned about education, for those who do not have a GED or a high school diploma, the likelihood that they're going to find themselves incarcerated you know, between the ages of 18 and 29 are, are pretty high. Uh, there are a number of factors that may include, include uh, the rise of crack cocaine, uh, federal and state sentencing laws, uh, a whole lot of points. Two general questions. Number one, how do you think we, we got to this point? And number two, what in particular is the role of the church, and in this case, particularly the black church, in addressing these issues? Uh, Pastor Ponder, I'll, I'll start off with you and then we'll, we'll open it up for others just to join. Sure. I think that it's, it's attributed to a, a large variety of different things. We can talk about lack of education. We talk about uh, extreme poverty uh, in communities all across this country. Um, I think you can attribute that to the lack of fathers uh, that are in the, you know, uh, in the homes. Uh, if you take a look at um, what has taken place over the, over the past years, uh, you know, the increase in that prison population and the rise in recidivism. I don't think that the community has done uh, absolutely nothing about that. You know, the answer to that, uh, to that recidivism or the 
the amount of people going into prison, their answer was to build more prisons. And we could see right now that that is absolutely not the right answer. I believe that the, uh, the answer to those things lies in the biblical principles, uh, which should be the, the foundation for which we address all of these, uh, all of these issues. Thank you. We actually have a scholar here, Dr. Wilcox at the uh, University of Virginia, who writes a great deal about fathers, the absence of and what that means to uh, families, particularly boys, but just, just to the whole social emotional aspect of learning. So glad you brought that up. Um, Bishop, I think you were getting it away in. Oh, yes, I, I concur 100%. Anytime there's a, a lack of fathers, there's a lack of direction. And then there's a lack of identity. And fathers, you know, have confirmed and affirm uh, their children. And when there's no fathers uh, present in the home, uh, no mentors. And so now we're looking at generations now where we say have made bad decisions, but we never take the time to discover that there were no options. They had no options. So many of them were forced to make the decisions that they made. And as a result of that, we're seeing broken families, broken homes. And, uh, and then we've got young men that's repeating uh, the process. I was in a prison speaking maybe two and a half years ago and uh, actually doing a two night revival in a prison. And a gentleman came up to me and says, I want uh, Bishop Webb, I want you to pray for my family. He says, uh, I'm a grandfather, my son is in prison and he says, I just got word that my grandson is on his way to prison. So you're looking at three generations. Here's a grandfather, here's a father, and they just received word that uh, the grandson is on his way. So when you have fathers that's incarcerated, there's no direction in the home. There's no foundations in the home. And thank God for the single moms, you know, thumbs up for them. But we've got to get, we got to empower our men again. We've got to get our men, uh, you know, back uh, on a solid foundation. And, uh, and it's sad because, you know, the system uh, that they, many of them had to endure and go through is set up for failure. And, and it reminds them of failure. But we've got to come along and, and you know, and say, no, we're going to break that generational curse. And we're going to remind you of your success. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pastor Wallace, you want to weigh in? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, when we look at where we are with the prison system and with incarceration, uh, we have to look at our history because if we look at our history, then we can understand where we're going. And there was a rapid acceleration in the incarceration rates uh, considering starting with the war on drugs. This is where it really all started. Okay. And initially in the 1980s, it was $17 billion that was spent on incarceration. And 80 billion is where we are today plus. And we have found that the system has now become our modern day New York Times stock market because of the initial uh, leverage that is had with privatization of prisons. We are now housing them instead of trying to go forth and do some type of rehabilitation for the church to get involved and even for us to take them under. We are our brother's keeper. When you mention about fathers, fathers are very important. But what we find in this country is that out of all of the population in the world, we are in fact housing 80% of right. people of color all around the world collectively into the prisons here in the United States. We, in, we incarcerate more men and women, especially men and women of color than any other nation in the world. So I think that as the, as the body of Christ, we should jump in, get involved and have the compassion that Jesus had where he was a servant leader. Thank you, Tony. That's, I agree with just about everything everyone said, um, Gerard. And once again, thank you for putting this on. I think the basic function of the church is to be involved in every facet of the life of the believer, but holding true to his mission. Christ looked at the needs of the people and provided it, and then began to preach out the good deeds. The church today must live up to his true billing. 
And when we look at what's happening in our, our nation right now, the church do more recruiting people to come inside the walls and then have them come and sit. You and I both know that when we talk about the male being in the family, it can trace this all the way back to when Blacks migrated to the North for welfare. And the system said, you can't have a man in the house. But the men gravitated to the streets or other places or other families. Some went off to uh, fight in our services. But those communities didn't change, it separated families. And then come heroin, crack cocaine, and all the other things that went through these communities destroyed the Black family. And we have the majority of the men and women that are in our incarceration systems are, are Black. And then you remote jail them, which means you put them in a jail or prison far away from their home. Right. And then they may visit them once or twice. But after that, that poor family that's struggling becomes what we call a transient community. And that transient community is always moving. And so the person that's incarcerated in the prison, he's always moving too. And what happens is this big separation of the family instead of a unification of the family. There. We have to get back to that mission of being a church and holding those elected officials accountable. We've been talking about reentry forever. We've had second chance months forever. You know, reentry is not a, a one month, just like we do Black history. Prison reform is every day because it's always moving and always changing. We have to do more in our in our nation. This is why the church must have a role in rest restorative justice reform movement. We must be there every day, holding people accountable. All of you touched on family, uh, men, single women. All of you also touched about how people move. Children of the incarcerated. Uh, we know there's at least 14 million uh, who've had an impact at some point in their life of having at least one incarcerated parent, be that jail or prison. You know, from the work that you do, how is this spilling over to children? And what are some things we could possibly do to address this? This is open to anyone. And don't wait for me to call in, just weigh in. Gerard, one of the things I would like to, um, to share in that regard is that we, uh, we prize ourselves when we're very, very uh, strategic that we rebuild families. Uh, the reunification of families, the reuniting of families, because oftentimes when men, uh, men and women are uh, incarcerated, they burn bridges. Uh, I mean, they've created a great divide. And then when they return, one of the things we do is not only restore them, but we reach out for the family. And uh, we made it a priority here in our restoration center. And that is even while uh, the men and women are in our restoration center, one of the first things that we encourage is to reach back for your family. You know, we got to get you straight first. We got to get you strong first. Because if you're not together, you're not going to be able to, to help your family. But we've seen family uh, reunification it is a beautiful picture to see. To me, that's total restoration. You know, once the man get on the right path or the woman gets on the right path, then I say, you got to reach back and bring your children. And when you see that unit come together, I mean, nothing can compare to that because that is total restoration. We've got men now uh, that's coming out of prison. And some of those that are coming into our, our program, the first thing we do is reach for their family, bring them together, bridge that gap. Because when a lot of them come through there, family don't want to have anything to do with them because they burn several every tie. But now through restoration, you have to implement the, you know, and bring the family together because the children are hurting when the father's gone or the mother's gone. One of the things that really, really touched my heart in moving into ministry uh, besides literally coaching and you, you find out a lot of things working with children. And then one year we volunteered to do angel tree. I didn't know exactly what it was other than just helping families. Well, I was like the assistant director and then something happened and they said, well, we're going to have you to be the director. And I'm like, wait a minute, what, you know, let me know what's going on here. And they said, well, these are families that's incarcerated. Uh, but we provide gifts for the children. And, uh, and so we ended up hosting that 20 some years ago, over almost 24, 25 years ago. And all of a sudden, you know, we had literally thousands of gifts. 
And man, there was like Grand Central Station. There was cars coming from everywhere, right here in our community in, in a part of the region. And I started seeing these kids jump out of the car with a grandmother or an aunt or an uh, you know or an uncle or whatever. And I'm saying I had no idea. I mean, my mind was closed from that part of the world. And that sparked a fire in my heart that we've got to reach out not just the people that are incarcerated. These kids are hurting. They don't celebrate Christmas with mom and dad. They're not here or Thanksgiving or their birthday. And then all of a sudden, you start thinking totally different. And from that birth, our restoration center, along with men going at that time, going to prison for a bag of dope. And so going to court and I'm saying, man, these are good guys here. These guys need help, but they had no representation. So uh, we, we call uh, and spoke with some of our judges, our PO officers and said, this is what's in our heart. They had never heard of a restoration center before, but I felt like it was something that God was speaking because we only wanted to help. But it was birthed out of seeing these children that was hurting that their mom and dad was not there to give them gifts and they couldn't sit around the tree and open gifts with them. And so as a result of that, it has now sparked into five restoration centers. And then we're looking to do something on a major, major scale, a scale for those that have been incarcerated for re-entry. And I'm working with Pastor Tony on that and we're so excited, but it's going to impact the family. So that's where my heart is, sir. Thank you. Yes. So I think Bishop Webb. You know, Gerard. Oh, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead, John. No, John I think Bishop ahead, Webb. Please. Bishop Webb hit it dead on the head. And where we have missed the mark uh, in this nation, where reentry is concerned, is that not enough emphasis has been put on the men and women that are returning home back to husbands and wives, and particularly right. getting reconnected with their children. Right, so that you know that is 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 imperative and is the key to the person's success because if you think about it, if the family life is not right, if the home life is not right, then everything else in the world is a tendency to fall apart. Right. So when we come up with creative ways to reach our tentacles into the family and wrap our arms around them and provide whatever service we can uh, to get them engaged and moving forward, then from a holistic approach, it's the entire family engaged, growing, and moving forward. We could work with men and women who are coming home, but if we don't have the insights on what's right. going on in the family, we could right. be taking them from the frying pan, throwing the smack dab in the middle of the fire. But right. we, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what could we do uh, as a ministry to, to make sure that that family is taken care of, right? To make sure that in, they may be coming home. And I'm going to use this instance to a mom who has been raising five kids. Dad's been in prison. She's been on, you know, a public assistance, right? But can we get into the family to provide some vocational training? Maybe, let, you know, take that person back to school, provide for childcare, so they can have that opportunity so that when the, the, the person is coming home, you in a sense have created a two income household. Uh, and you know, that, you know, that is gonna lead to much more success, but the family uh, is key. Yes. You know, Gerard, let's talk about the numbers. Currently right now, there is 2.7 million children in the United States whose parents are incarcerated right now at this very moment. We have over 5 million children, approximately 7% of minor children have experienced incarceration of a residential parent at some point during their childhood. We got to understand that America, we have this bubble that is busting because not only are those children, parents are being incarcerated because of what happens to the family, right. those children are walking into the same footsteps, there especially in our inner cities. And now even in our rural communities, we're starting to see a great deal of this. It's affecting all 17 of our federal agencies. In Missouri, they've brought in Department of Family Children's Services. They've done an analysis and assessments of the men and women they have in their prison. And what they found out, they can trace all the way back to when these, these men and women was in their prisons when they were children, that they were getting some form of government aid. And somewhere between that getting that form of government aid they end up in prison. And then when they get ready to come out, they end up on that same government aid. 
But Department of HUD says they can't go back to their own family and live in that governmental house. We have to change this whole system because the system is broken. Right. It's warehousing people. Right. And they're yes. on their way to the prison. And, and let me tell you about the church, for example, and this role in this. The churches have bands sitting in their parking lots right. in gated cages when on Saturdays and Sundays or during the week, they can be taking children to go visit their, their families and right. then counseling them both to deal with the trauma to put them back together. But that ain't what the church does. Right. The church brings people in the church and have them sit and right. clap holy hands and sing right. and walk back out in the community and the family the same way. That's when you right. get back to the numbers, we have 2 million kids right now in our nation. Right. Our parents are incarcerated. And right. there's no plan, no joint plan. Our future is in trouble right. if we don't do something about that. Pastor Tony, can I chime in for just a moment? Uh, I want to thank you because when you when you spoke over in Cape Girardeau and I was invited to that meeting, I sat up straight from the moment you grabbed the microphone. And where my heart was touched is that you challenged the pastors in the churches. And that's why I'm on today. I'm, I'm thankful for this opportunity. And I've said for years that we play a major role in the community, but ministry cannot stop after 12 o'clock on Sunday. And that's the shame. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a shame. It, it breaks my heart to see that. And in some places, churches have outreach ministries, but they don't reach out. And you can't have an outreach ministry and not reach out. So at the end of the day, now things are being reconstructed. The ministry is different now. Where people just come for inspiration and get to clap on, get to shout on, get to dance on, get to preach on, get to sing on, and then they're gone. And then we've got a community that's hurting. They had a commercial on about six or seven years ago about the Whopper at Burger King, where people was driving through and they were ordering the Whopper. And, uh, and they said, we don't sell the Whopper anymore. And they said, what do you mean you don't sell the Whopper? Well, I want a Whopper. And they said, no, we don't, we don't sell it no more. Somebody else called in, ordered a Whopper. They said, we don't sell it. And people started screaming. What in the world are y'all doing? You know, and so from that, from that commercial, it was like the Lord spoke to me that if your church closed down in the community, would they know that it's gone? Would they know that it's closed? Hmm. And if your doors close in your community and people never know that you're closed, that's a good sign that you have not been light and salt and you have not affected your community. We've got to come out of the pulpit. And when you finish preaching, We've got to start touching these people that are hurting moms, dads that strung out on crack. The children are, you know, being shifted through a system. But we play a major role in the church to impact the community. The days of just preaching and singing is over. We've got to start building centers and reaching out. Man, I'm about to get excited. You better grab the mic. Well, I I'm in mean, if I could, please, in regards to the church. And Pastor, you're absolutely right. And we, as the body of Christ, have a very great influential uh, with the those that are incarcerated. But part of what is happening in the church, as you said, Pastor, that we're sitting in the church, we're preaching on Sundays. But what we fail to realize is the people that are coming into our churches, they have giftings, they have talents that can be honed in and used to build these families. We right. don't need... We don't need to just follow those that are coming back into the community once of say 90 days or 120 days before they're released. We need to follow them on the inception of the incarceration and the whole family. With our ministry, what we've done is we, we serve in one of the most dangerous and most poorest areas in, in this part of uh, Virginia. And we decided a long time ago, when we went in there, we would drop our anchor. We're not coming in there just for funding. We're not coming in there for notoriety or to have our names and lights. We're coming in there to roll up our sleeves and do the work that the Lord has called us to do. And that is to minister to the family 360, the one that's incarcerated 
and even also providing for those that are his families that are still left behind. Because once the dad or the mom is incarcerated, the family is incarcerated. Their income is affected. The child is, is subject to all types of mental anguish and even a stigma in the school systems. We have to learn to just get out of the church pulpit, as you said, do the work, put boots on the ground, surround right by giving them what they need. Also too, what we fail to realize is those that are incarcerated, the men and the women, there's a problem, there's a disconnect because once the man is, is in prison, he wants to maybe reconnect with his family, but it's a dollar or $2 a minute for him to call home. And then you, you're faced with the fact that when the man leaves the home, there's an impact with the economically so the mother may not be able to afford to receive the call, or it may be the grandmother raising the child. She cannot afford to receive those calls. And so now right. the man feels disconnected. Now I'm gonna say, this is making me a little bit of trouble, but I can tell you firmly that I preach this all the time, that there are many great women that raise their sons, but yes. it's a father, it takes a man to raise a man totally. And right. this is what we're missing. Amen. And so when the men are incarcerated, we're missing the fathering in the home. I grew right. up in a, my parents, my mother, we would get in trouble, but she would simply say this one statement that horrified us, wait till your daddy get home. And so <laughs> that, that, that's where I am before we stand. And I believe that we can do this uh, collectively as a church, but it takes leaders that are ready to lay down their time lay down the fact that maybe their name's not going to be in lights and do the work that Jesus has called right. us. Mm. Hey, Gerard, you might want to, you might want to have a panel one day titled uh, churches, wait till your father come home. Cause when Jesus <laughs> comes back, they're going to be some surprised people that just might get their butt beat because they have not been doing the job. They've been right. missing. Let me give you a prime example. This pandemic has been the worst of our nation history besides civil rights and all the other things that we've been through. But every time a neighborhood exploded in riots or a person got shot and killed by a police officer, they didn't call the church or the pastor. Who, who was his job to speak on these moral issues and be the leader of those communities? They called a political hack or a lawyer. Right. The pastors are completely missing from the equation. Right. And so when you call somebody who's more about the R or the D and not the lamb, you get confusion. Right. You, you have to have someone that has the heart of our communities that say, you know what? We're going to do something about this on our own. We're going to make sure that we elect people. And those people are yeah. going to make sure that we have a diverse police force. Right. Yeah. We're going to make sure that someone's take reentry and prison reform serious. Right. We don't have that because the spiritual leaders of those communities are missing. And then when you have the fathers missing, you have the perfect storm in the Black community. Let me go to you, uh, Pastor Ponder. Your, the title of your organization, Hope for Prisoners. So you've already said who you're going to work with and you're going to give them hope. This is time for us to go into your individual ministries as they relate to criminal justice reform. And all of you have a holistic approach, education, food, restoration. Let's start with you. Why did you even create an organization with this name? It's pretty clear what you want to do. What was the aha moment for you? Right. Well, the aha moment for me uh, was when I was, because um, I had been coming in and out of the prison system since, you know, for, forever. My aha moment for me was when I was standing in the prison cell about to go before a judge. Uh, and because of some criminal history, uh, you know, I had the potential of being sentenced to the next 23 years of my life. Uh, and my aha moment was when I stood in that cell and I asked God to forgive me for the sins that I've committed, which he, he did. And then I asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life and to step in and turn my life around. And unmistakably, he did. So when I went off to prison behind 50 foot walls, I tell people I didn't go to prison. I, I went to Bible college and I spent the duration of my time. Uh, number one, trying to really fully understand and discover who this God is that everyone was talking about. 
Um, and the more and more I discovered about him, the more and more I began to understand about me and who it was that he created me to be. And then he, out of that, he dropped this mantle on me uh, to turn right back around and help other men and women who are facing those same challenges that I once had to face to do everything I can to remove the barriers that are preventing them from being successful and to help to escort them up to the next level of life. So, oh, you know, Hope of Prisons was, 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 a, was a vision that God had impregnated me with uh, that when I came home in 2009, I started digging trenches in this community and began to put it together, beginning to work with people uh, prior to them getting released. And I've heard people say um, on this call that reentry starts day one, and 100% that's right. I think that we could uh, in our nation's prison systems do a, a much better job at preparing men and women prior to them being released so that they could be successful uh, you know, once they, once they get out. Uh, there needs to be a continuum mechanism, um, a continuum care mechanism like the one we've created with Hope of Prisoners. It starts on the inside and then it works for, you know, we, we work with them for up to 18 months you know, after they get released and bringing in the family, providing the supportive services, getting them connected with churches all across our community. And let me tell you the reason why that is so important, why the church really needs to come together in the book of accents of the word on one accord. When, when men and women are coming home from the prison system. And then that, I'll tell you a story that uh, a pastor shared with me uh, many years ago. He said that inside his church many, many years ago, there was an ATM machine. Uh, in the lobby of the church. And he said one night the security cameras uh, captured uh, uh, some guys backing up uh, a pickup truck uh, to the front doors. They got out and they tied a chain on the bumper. They put it inside the church and they tied it on the ATM machine. And they tried to pull the ATM machine out of the, out of the church and the, the chain came off. They backed up and tried it again and they repeated that process until they were completely frustrated and they left. And he said that the reason why they could not pull the ATM machine out of the lobby of the church is because the ATM machine was anchored into the foundation of the church. Hmm. And this is the reason why the churches really need to come together for our men and women that are coming home to get them anchored in the local church so that when the world tries to pull them back out, they're, they're immovable because they're anchored uh, in the local church. Yeah, because you've actually lived inside a prison cell and you're out 2009. What was the initial reception to the idea that you wanted not only to create this? And as someone who grew up in New York, now in Nevada, were there any reception like you're not from here, you're in it but not of it? What were some of the ideas? I think that it was, uh, people were looking at me like I completely lost my mind. And I told them I did because I now have the mind of Christ. You know, it was, it was, very challenging uh, trying to you know convince people and you know there were many doors that were slammed in my face when I'm trying to get the ministry up and running and you know people looking at my, my past but had no idea you know that I had that face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus and we just began to you know just you know saturate in everything that we do uh, with prayer and God began to open up those doors and uh, we've been able to make a tremendous impact uh, you know in our local community with one of the lowest recidivism rates in the country floating around somewhere around six percent but people uh, you know 75 percent of people gaining full-time employment and sustainable wage jobs so they can take care of themselves and be able to take care of their family. But the big thing is going on the inside, and I speak from my personal experiences, that, the, uh, that the, the, the infrastructure of a prison system creates habits in people that are the exact opposite of successful. In other words, if you're, you, you're doing time a particular way over the course of two or three years because of the infrastructure of the prison system, it's impossible for you to be successful when you get released, because you form these habits that got you stuck. So we're able to get into the prison system and create an environment of, 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 of learning that's going to stimulate the, the, the you know, growth and development. And so that it helped them to be able to um, understand uh, that hope, impart hope in them, that there's a future outside the perimeter of those four walls that can look so much different than their past. And I think that that is what you know, is going to lead to phenomenal success. Bishop, I think you were getting ready to weigh in. 
Oh, I, I'm just, I concur 100%. Um, I'm thankful uh, that many years, 22 years ago, well, soon to be 22 years uh, in January, that we started our restoration center. And a part of that was birthed out of the angel tree, as I alluded to. Then we saw young men going to prison uh, for just minor, you know, things. And But there was no other, I mean, resources or, or anyone to reach out for them. So I, I pulled some influences together, shared my heart and said, this is what we would like to do. And, and, and I must, um, you know, admit that there's no way we could have done what we've done without help, you know, thank God for the help of the Lord, but God touched people and we had major contributors and some of them may be online now, but they believed in the vision. They had the same heart of helping people. And so as a result of that, you know, uh, we would get uh, receive phone calls uh, on early release, but there's no house plan. And so, but now the restoration center plays a part that men can come back here and not just get a bed and three hots in a cot, but to set them up for success. That when they come in the program, when they leave out of the program, they got money for a deposit, they got money for rent, they got money for furniture, they saved their money, didn't have to give us anything at that particular time, and we poured right back into them, set them up for success. And then part two was, now that we have the Restoration Center, I can begin to tell you how many have not gone to prison because of our relationship with uh, the judge and the prosecutors and said, would you allow them to come in our Restoration Center? But what if it wasn't there for men and women? So we built not just for men, but for women. And then later on, a lot of our veterans, after they've served time, and, and I mean, uh, for our country and then come back and some of them were struggling with substance abuse and homelessness. So we built also centers for our veterans and men and women. So we have all these things together, but it couldn't have happened without support, without help. But the church had, uh, my goodness, I cannot stress on this enough. The church is important in the community. And as Pastor Tony, my good friend said, it's got to be more than singing and more than preaching. And, uh, and let us in before they come out. Then when they come out, they already have a successful setup and a program. And then we can teach them. And as Apostle alluded to earlier, honing those skills and channeling them in the right direction. You can sell drugs. You can sell shoes. You know, come on now. Amen. I mean, and turn that, that hustle and that habit into something good. And, and so that you can be productive in the kingdom of God. But I believe that this is the beginning of a new beginning. We, our churches are different now. We've got to impact our community. The day for building big churches, high steeple, cold people, that day is over. We've got to be light and salt to the community. That's what's important. Let me, let me ask you right. a question um, before we, um, what I'm going to do is I'm ask you a question. And once you finish, we'll run to the apostle and Tony McCombie, you. I just talk about your work. Um, so you you have something for men, something for women. You're talking about something yeah. for veterans. So you've got a pretty ubiquitous approach. Uh, same question I asked with, uh, you know, uh, Pastor Ponder. When you came up with this idea that people think you were crazy, or they think yeah. you're trying to maybe compete with other groups who were saying, we're already doing that. Right. Where in fact, there was no one doing it. So that okay. was good. Okay. Yeah. Now, my challenge was some of the preachers that I went to, to show you the mindset. This is what they said to me. Bishop, if I had your schedule of preaching, there ain't no way I'll be fooling with some drug addicts. Mm. See, that was the mindset. Why would you build something, a restoration center? What is that? Why would you waste your time building a restoration center when you when you're, have a schedule that's demanding your services across the country? If I had your schedule, there's no way I would be doing that. Well, but that shows you the mindset. Now, this Hollywood mentality is changing now. The pandemic is hitting now. Where's all the Hollywood stars now in Christendom? They don't exist. You follow me? So 
what you know when the pandemic hit we wasn't in shock we we didn't make excuses we made some adjustments but we've been feeding uh hundreds of people every week for 22 years mm -hmm. okay yeah. so this is nothing new for us but we just had to make some adjustments uh not just the people here in the church but in the community every sunday over three four hundred people we prepare a full course meal for and so even when the pandemic hit our staff said, well, we can't prepare anymore because of social distancing. I said, no, 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 no. If the restaurants can prepare and send it to go, we're going to continue to do it. And yeah. from that day to this day, we've never stopped feeding. Thousands show up here every week for over a year. We're going to continue until the food program ends. But yes, they. some of them laughed at me, Gerard. Some of them said, man, I wouldn't waste my time. Well, I'm saying this is ministry, but saying the same people that laughed at us five years after it had became a successful program, ask us for the blueprints of our building. And so now they're starting to do it. You follow me? Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're going to be talked about there because it was different from ministry. Because I said, why would you be in ministry and not helping people? I, I couldn't, I couldn't put that together. Let me go over to you, Apostle Wallace. I've had a chance to look at some of the work that you're doing. You mentioned that you're in some, some tough zip codes. Talk about your group, work you're doing, whole piece. Can't hear you, Apostle. Sure. I apologize. Praise the Lord. No I apologize. You couldn't hear me. That's almost like uh, synonymous with uh, what's happening in our country when we talk about helping those that are returning and recidivism. It's almost like they can't hear us, but we're, we're talking. But uh, mm -hmm. as we begin to get started, I got started on Man of 5,000 Ministry, M5K Ministry, about 30 years ago. Been in ministry for 30 years and uh, left a very lucrative career uh, where uh, I was really blessed. As I said in the beginning, I was negotiating with the Lord when I received the call. And uh, I thought it was, I, I was rebuking it saying, I know you don't want me to go do this, but I knew uh, eventually that it was the Lord and I had to answer the call. We serve in our ministry, we uh, serve the communities. We go into some of the most criminalized areas and some of the most impoverished areas in the cities throughout the Hampton Roads region. And we have uh, been doing this for uh, many, many years. We've been in situations where in our serving every week, we serve uh, fresh produce that is uh, probably not available to most families that they probably could not afford it. If they had to make a, a choice between uh, buying blueberries or some other high priced produce in the store, they would have to result to buying something less. And with that, we have been able to share these resources with the families, not only food, but also furniture, uh, book supplies, school supplies, and we've partnered with numerous partners that we have. But we do this as a church, and this is, an, uh, this is something, a vision that the Lord had given because of the fact that the people were hurting. Uh, with that, we also, uh, prior to the pandemic, we were working with uh, those that were on work release that were about to be released back into the community. And I was excited about that. They were men and women. And just want to share uh, one of the things that we found, one of the testimonies is a lot of times they're looking for acceptance. They're reentering the community. Mm -hmm. uh, they're coming back in some many times with a stigma, many times where the church rejects them. And I can't tell you the numerous amount of, um, of our citizens that have returned, that have gone to their churches, wanting to start a vision, wanting to get started, simply for the church to say, yes, we're excited about you doing this, the church leaders. And when they find out they have a felony or a record, they don't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, we, ha we have to change that as the body of Christ. And right. one of the things that we can do is perhaps to remember that if not by grace, it could have been us that was incarcerated. It could have been yeah. us from jail. It could have been us that were cracked out. And we have to find within ourselves a place of humbling ourselves before a mighty God. Because just because 
this young man or this young woman had gone to jail and been incarcerated, their life is just as valuable as ours. So what we did is we also uh, have a gleaning network that we work with uh, uh, an agency with regards to that. And with that gleaning network, we usually glean about 5 million pounds of, of food per year hmm. and freely give it away throughout the whole Hampton Roads area, also at the border of North Carolina, as far as Washington, D.C. But what is unique about that, we were using those that were on uh, work release and they were coming out into the field. And one of the testimonies that I remember very vividly, it was a day where we were gleaning, I believe it was collard greens. It was cold, it was wet. Uh, the conditions were, were pretty, pretty horrendous. And one of, uh, one of the inmates came and, and he came up to me and he said, preacher, let me tell you this. He said, I didn't sign up for all of this. I said, well, everybody's enjoying it. You're not having fun. He said, let me tell you something. After being out here today, I'm never coming back to jail. I don't care if I got to work five jobs to pay child support. I'm never coming back to jail. I said, son, this is building, this is building you up. It's giving you some skill sets. But his point was this. It wasn't a place of punishment, but he found out about the hard work. But then he came back after the fact when we began to distribute it into the areas. He was so enriched with the fact that the very ones, his very colleagues, his, his, his friends, even some family members saw him on the back of the truck helping to hand out collards, doing the Lord's work. And it just built up his character. It built up his self-confidence. And I say that to make the point that we've got to invest in people. We've got to invest in families. But most importantly, uh, as I can reference to Dr. Michelle Alexander when she talked about the new Jim Crow, this is what's happening with the incarceration. We have in this country 80% of the women in the world, that percentage is what the percentage is of women that are incarcerated in the prisons in the United States. And a lot of times when we talk about uh, aborted recidivism and when we talk about reentry, we sometimes forget that the women are also suffering as well. Um, so we, we, we need to make sure that we address the needs of the mothers because as I said, some of them are mothers and now they're incarcerated, they're disconnected from their children, they can no longer make decisions about their children, they're not able to communicate effectively. So what we have done is we worked, we went forth and we approached the social services, we approach the, the local law enforcement, we approach the churches, we also approach several of our vendors and several of our donors. And when you share your vision, sometimes, and I appreciate what Pastor said prior to that, they're going to talk about you. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think it's not worth it. They're going to tell you they don't have time to do it but we have to be about our father's business. Now that's the one side of what our ministry does, but we also are involved with trying to make sure that we educate people. If we can have knowledge, then we can make prudent decisions. And what happens with making prudent decisions, we can make prudent decisions when we go to vote in the elections, whether it's on national elections or the local elections. Right now, what is happening is that we're having a discussion about how to be involved in the community as a body of Christ and as the church, but we also need to hold accountable the politicians. There is money in so many departments up in Washington that is available for re-entry, that is available for building up communities, but yet we're not holding our politicians accountable enough to let them know that the, it, it stops here you are going to be accountable because we have got to make sure that what we what is happening and what is being done now is not working it is not successful it is causing more and more incarceration and we also have to also address as the body of Christ the privatization of the local jails and the federal prisons as well that's a good segue into some of the things that Tony's done I mean you've had a chance as a pastor to bring your faith to your work. Recently in Washington, D.C., prior to that in Atlanta. Talk to me about the roles that you played in this, in particular as it relates to education and, and workforce development. Because, uh, you know, uh, Apostle Wallace had some really interesting points. In fact, the follow-up question I have 
uh, she had just answered. Talk to us. Yeah, I, I, in, my, in my role, when I first got involved in this, um, when Governor Nathan Dill brought me on board in Atlanta, one of the first things I saw, I had to visit a prison in Atlanta. And as they gave me a tour around this prison, this elderly white woman who volunteers, her name is Katie Wright. She volunteers in this prison in Atlanta. And she said, no, Tony, they're showing you some other stuff. I want you to see this. And she kept pulling me and I said, I said I'll get them to teach you no, tell them this is where you want to go. And finally, she took me into this, this wing, this ward inside this prison that was a hospice, a mm -hmm. hospice inside the prison. What mm -hmm. broke me and, 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 and fueled my fire and pushed me to want to do more was that this young man who was making his way between hell and heaven asked the question. I said, young man, is there anything I can do for you? He said, can you just get a preacher to come up here and pray for me? He didn't even know my role at all or who I was, but... Here he was dying and wanted a pastor to pray for him. And I decided I had to do more. And I started trying to kick the door down because not only is the inmates who come out of our prison institutionalized, our institutions are institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And our churches and our communities are institutionalized. So you gotta change them all. You gotta kick them all in the mouth. That's why we put charter schools inside prisons. Because 73% of the men and women in our prisons don't have a high school diploma. We would need them to get the high school degree if we can. Then we start putting all other kind of programs, bringing churches in. Then we start doing things with heating and air and welding inside the prisons. A lot of the First Step Act is based on Georgia. And we had to get up there and, and do more work. And so when I got called to be appointed on a federal level, it was my goal to try to break up this institution, the way we do things. The stigma that we place on inmates coming home is unreal. 66,000 collateral consequences when a person comes home. They learn how to be firemen and firewomen in prison and they can't get a job at a firehouse when they come home. They learn how to do heating and welding and can't get an occupational license when they come home. And the sister talked about voting, but let, I have an issue because we can galvanize the churches to vote and the churches are, are, are fighting the capitals around the nation to have a day where the churches can vote on Sunday, right? Imagine if they took that same passion right. and dealt with foster care children, right. children who are, are selling their bodies on the streets. Imagine if they took that same passion and dealt with uh, men and women who are in our prisons. Imagine if they took that same passion. See, they are worshiping man instead of worshiping the lamb and taking their faith and allow them to lead and make decisions. You want the right to vote on Sunday, but you don't execute anything after Sunday. You think the person that you elect is going to do the job for you. That's not what Christ called us to do. We're supposed to be the salt and light of the earth. We're right. supposed to tell Caesar and Pharaoh what the people need. And we don't do that. We give that to a man. And then we fight for wedge issues, the right to vote, uh, abortion rights, all these things we fight for to have Supreme Court judges. And we forget the fact that our community are hurting. Right. And so we're responsible, Gerard. The church is responsible for this issue. And that young man that was asking for salvation before he died in the hospice, my responsibility. It's my responsibility to do everything I can to stop our children from going into these prisons and fix these failing schools. We know where they are. I go any city in the nation, any county, and tell you what kids are going to go to prison right now. We know who's going. I can go to any place in the nation and tell you what are the high risk inmates that's coming out of our prisons that's mm -hmm. not going to make it. If I know this data, right. I have a responsibility as a governor to do something about it right. because my constituents want my community to be safe. We have to have smart policing, smart corrections, and smart reintegration back into our communities. If we don't do that, our communities are going to collapse. And we saw that during the pandemic when every prison in the nation was shut down and programs couldn't get in. Riots were starting to happen. Wardens was worried about what are they going to do 
these men and women are locked down and they have nothing to do. Chaplains can come into the prisons because of the pandemic. The church is shut down. And when people, watch this, churches shut down and the people did not miss their churches. Why? Because the church was just getting together to clap their hands and sing. They weren't <laughs> in the streets with the community. Right. right? They wasn't in biblical court to their communities. Now, I'm not, you're going, there's going to be some pastors saying, why is that man bashing the churches? Let me tell you something. The truth hurts. A hit dog will always yell. But if you step back and look at what you're doing, ask your, your prison minister to give you a report. How many times have they been in the prison? Ask them how many times you met with the Chamber of Commerce or Department of Labor or Department of Energy or Workforce Development. They're all part of your community. Stop begging. When the word says we should occupy, mm -hmm. and what's occupying the church's community is prostitution, people selling our children and our boys and our little girls, drugs and gangs, and you think it's always the legislature that got to change it. What mm -hmm. is the church occupying? Because right. they're definitely not occupying the prisons. And reentry starts at the time of arrest. Gerard, you remember when the riots was breaking out in Los Angeles because of Rodney King. Mm -hmm. They called Evie Hill, Chip Murray, the first AME, Fred Price, and Bishop Blake to try to get the people to stop from fighting and burning up everything. They called the religious leaders. Right. And they called the politicians or a lawyer. The religious leaders have to step up and not be afraid that someone may say, I'm a Democrat or Republican. You worship the lamb, not right. the elephant or the donkey. All right. We're now at the point where we're going to open this up to uh, the viewing audience. Uh, what I'd like for you to do is to raise your virtual hand and I'll have an opportunity to call on you. What I will ask is if you uh, ask a question, uh, identify one or two people you want to answer. I uh, want to give everybody as much time as possible, so please make sure that uh, you do so succinctly. So the first person I see is Gary, and Dan is on our team. Dan is going to play a role in unmuting you. Gary, it's up to you. Thank you. God bless you, everybody. And uh, this is so exciting. And I, I really would like to get in touch with everybody here. I am, Paul, I am a director of the Returning Youth Initiative, where it's part of the uh, Post-Incarceration Juvenile Justice Reformation Act Initiative. And we are going to be rolling out to all 3,142 counties in the United States. We're in the process of uh, launching into 50 states right now in 60 days. And we have real solid ways how we can partner with churches. And I don't want to go through it here. I, I don't, I don't want to take people's time. I'm just looking for the opportunity to talk to someone. And you can explore what we have to offer. Uh, and perhaps we can have a follow-up call. And we can discuss some real exciting ways that I believe we can partner with you to reduce recidivism rate in the African-American community. Thank you, Gary. If you can, um, put your email address in the chat box. Yep. Send it to all panelists and attendees, and that yep. way we'll make sure that we get to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. No problem. Thank you, Gary. All right. We're going to turn it over to uh, Kevin Moore, uh, who has his hand up. And we're going to go ahead and uh, unmute you on our side of the fence, and you should unmute yourself. Hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Kevin Moore. Um, I'm um, currently a doctoral student at Liberty University. Uh, I heard a lot of good things, especially, I believe, from Brother Tony. Uh, I felt your passion. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me significantly is uh, you have a lot of churches that don't, uh, they're, they're so stagnant. And as I think I put in one of the chat uh, portions is uh, that um, you have um, churches that has mistaken their inside auxiliaries and programs uh, with um, community development. And um, but that being said, uh, I learned a lot. And, uh, I do believe in intentional outreach. You know, my mentor, Mr. Mr. Rod, was intentional uh, when um, he saw potential in myself. 
and he inspired me. Now I aspire to be uh, like him. Um, so outreach definitely works if churches are intentional and deliberate in their approach, um, as opposed to just um, creeping inside the walls. And that's about it. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Moore also, as you mentioned about Charles Stu, he also had a question that he had sent just in case he was uh, unable to join us. One of the questions is what role has secularization and go globalization played on not only the incarceration and how we think about it, but the church's response or lack of response to it? Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining and uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to any of you who want to answer. Well, Gerard, I think one of the things that have occurred to church church place separation church and state you know and, and that has kept churches at bay and they want to just pray right we'll pray for the, our nation we'll pray for those individuals and let me tell you christ called us to go not just pray but go and we got to get to the point that we're being able to look at ways of making a difference i guarantee you right now if i said i want to talk to judges across the nation who wants to help stop men and women, especially children, from going into the prisons, I guarantee my email will be full today. Because mm -hmm. judges want to hear from pastors. Right. There was a time when something happened, the pastors was the one to go to the judge first, before they went to prison, right. doing arraignment. Re-entry starts at arraignment and working with DAs all across the nation. How is it that a church can elect the DA and allow the DA to come to his church and raise his hand and say, I'm running for office, but never talk to him afterwards. Right. So that is crazy. And because the church is silent on these issues, that's why the young people are not joining your church. Hmm. They don't see their leader leading in a way with a servant leader's heart. Anyone else want to weigh in? You know, I think that there are... Um, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but you know, it is what it is. There are a lot of great um, organizations out there, social service providers that provide the service. But I believe that the only reason they exist is because the church is missing them all. All right. You're 100% right, John. This moment, just uh, to share a little bit about, I uh, went on a mission trip, uh, over the last few years and had an opportunity to uh, go to Kenya. And uh, the Lord just moved me with compassion, but also uh, was a foretaste of what the United States could trend towards. And there's an area called Cabrilla slums. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it is a very impoverished area. And in this impoverished area, they're, they're, they're like uh, little shanty houses or huts. There's no running water in this whole community. And there is 1.7 million people that live in Cabrillo slums. And it is truly the slums. Wow. Their the electricity is not there, sanitation is not there. And I had a chance to walk through there uh, by some of the, the Kenyans incognito and just to kind of mingle and talk with the people. And I didn't quite understand the fullness of why the Lord would have me to walk through there because I know we're there for missions work. But what the Lord was really speaking to my heart is that's where we're going to trend towards as a country, as the United States, if we're not. The reason I bring up Cabrillo slums is that even though there is a prime minister there, within Cabrillo slums, there were also leaders that were running the show. There were leaders that were running the show regarding drug trafficking, regarding human trafficking, regarding prostitution, regarding all types of, of, of criminal elements. And why am I mentioning this? Because as I talk with the residents there, they had no hope. They mm -hmm. had no hope. And there were churches all around, there was funding all around, but they had no hope. In the United States, if we're not careful, we're going to trend towards that within our communities, especially those that are income restricted communities, because what we serve every week, there were times where we've had to jump off the back of the truck and drive off because uh, about two months ago, the gunshots, we could hear the bullets hitting the wall and the people were standing in line. 
but the mothers were grabbing the babies and running away and trying to take cover. We're trying to take cover at the same time. But, but I'm saying that to make the point, as, as Pastor Loudon said, the church has got to wake up. We have been in a comatose state for far too long. And it's time for us to come together, to lay it down, to acknowledge that we can do better and that we have the responsibility to show that there is a more excellent way for those that are coming out of prison, for those that are in prison. And, and here's the thing, there is such a stigma when you mention the fact that someone is an inmate or coming out of the of, of jail and having a record, but that's what Jesus did. He restored people. Right. Even when he looked upon them and he said, how long have they been like this? The scripture tells us he looked with, to them with compassion. That's mm -hmm. what we're missing out of the churches today is passion to acknowledge that we can do better, that we can go forth. People don't come to our churches just to sit there. They should not and just clap and, and sweat up their clothes and go home. They have gifting sitting in your houses, hosts of faith. There are ones that have careers that, that could help build this whole infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But until we make a move to stop dreaming and put the mm -hmm. dream drive, that is when we're gonna see progress. Thank you. Uh, uh, Gerard. Oh, one sec, let me make sure it, I can it, 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 talk to me, Let me get Woody, Jared in, and then you can weigh in uh, on that uh, as a follow-up. Awesome. So Woody, Jared, I see an electronic hand up. We're gonna go ahead and unmute you, you unmute yourself. and. It's yours. Uh, good evening or uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Willie Jared. I pastor here in uh, Wake Cross, Georgia. And um, just had a, a really informative, uh, educational. Um, I missed the first half, but I, I caught uh, most of the second half. My question um, is to Apostle Sharon Wallace. Uh, she mentioned that there were uh, programs in the, um, on the federal level to help with um, these programs, reentry, things of that nature. So, how do I find out what's available on the local or even the state level to um, see what these programs are and how can we get tap into it to help um, our youth and, and those returning citizens? Thank you, Woody. We'll turn it over to Apostle and Tony. You should probably weigh in on two fronts. Yes, I, I was going to say, Pastor Lana may probably would have a lot more information than I do, but I can certainly say now that. Uh, God bless you, that it is imperative. Uh, it's a great question because it's imperative that we search out the federal monies that are there. Uh, many of the departments have monies for uh, to help decrease the percentage of recidivism and also for those that are reentering the community. Those are also in departments such as Department of Agriculture, Department of Homeland Security, also the Department of Health and Human Services. There are many federal departments, but, but what happens a lot of times that money is shifted around and moved because as the body of Christ and as churches and as nonprofit, we fail to pursue it and we fail to, to grab a hold of the opportunities that are there. And I'm gonna to yield to Pastor Loudon. Thank you, Apostle. Well, thank you, Sharon. Um, first of all, all 17 federal agencies uh, have money in this space for reentry, all 17. I held a meeting at the Situation Room at the White House, and I had did my research, and I had every sec head of the secretary of every agency there at the Situation Room. In the Situation Room, we talked about all the money that they have, and most people will be shocked that the Department of Agriculture have millions of dollars for reentry every year. Department of Energy, Workforce mm -hmm. Development, Department mm -hmm. of Labor, Department of Education. Everyone that you think of have money in this space. Health and Human Services, they all have money in this space. And here's the, the communication breakdown. They send out all these grants and RFPs on their websites. Most churches don't have time to have a person to go through these information. What we need to do is the local communities need to be talking to the local agencies of these federal agencies. And then your next step is to have an appointment with your federal representative. Because and this is the best time to talk to them because they're all getting ready for midterm campaigns. Right. They sit down and say, listen, I wanna be a part of this. I want those resources to come to my community and have your aides send me all the money that's available and that's so we can apply. And then don't apply on your own. Make sure it is a collaboration of other agencies nonprofit chamber of commerce 
John does a great work of that in Nevada, but working with all these agencies to partner together. Because if you don't do that, you're, you, have, you don't have a record. Even if you win the grant, first thing they will say, well, we got to deny them because they don't have the, the financial capabilities to pull down $11 million. They have no records of it. But you can partner with the city right. to go out these crime bills uh, dollars that's out there. Health and Human Services, Department of, of, of Family, Children, and Service, which is a DFAC, uh, they're all trying to look for nonprofits to work with to do pilot programs to help with returning citizens. It's a must to make that happen. And I would designate some people in my church who are go-getters to put them on this issue. And brother, uh, uh, Jared, I know of your ministry down there. You, you do some great work down there, uh, you and your wife. You guys have a great opportunity to partner and this is the time to make it happen. Thank you. One of the questions uh, someone shared with me um, in case uh, she wasn't able to get on board, she said the, the churches have done a great job working with those who are incarcerated, who've talked about their families. What about those who are the victims? Uh, what role is the church to play in that? And are there programs either you're working with or do you know of others who are working to address those who've been victimized? Yeah. There's a gentleman by the name of Dean True Leader, who the founder of Healing Communities. And Healing Communities is a program that we also started in Georgia, and we tailored it to Georgia. And basically challenges churches to get involved with those who are just as involved. But more importantly, to also be there for those victims. Because a lot of times, the families are the victims of crimes. And their loved ones are in prison, and they're coming home. Think about somebody's on crack, and they've been stealing from the family for, for years, and they finally get arrested, and they got to come back home. The family is now on zero because of all the things that this person, a father or mother, has done. We have to heal the families as well. Some of them are victims of crimes. And there's all different types of programs that bring them into an engagement to restore the victim and the person who committed the crime against them. Because if we don't, it's never going to happen. We have to restore the whole community. There's some people that are in charge of big businesses that has been hurt by people of, who are now incarcerated. They want to hire people. That forgiveness is important. There's a lady in my church right now who lost a son to a drunk driver, guilty. And the one thing she told me, she said, you know what? I wrestle with forgiveness. Hmm. And she has to forgive that person that killed her son hmm. so that she can move forward. In John Ponder's program, he has a host of videos of people that have reached that point of forgiving the person and then coming back. Yeah, a gentleman who a police well, officer well, killed his brother. Let me put a and have him weigh in on this. Thank you, Tony, for your points. Yeah, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, that, as Tony indicated, uh, you know, that forgiveness portion is, is so very, very important. You have to make sure that you're bringing the, the, the victims uh, to make sure that they're having some healing um, in that entire process. Um, you know, there's many instances um, where uh, we work with the victims and also work with the people that are coming home. Uh, sometimes we have a huge law enforcement uh, partnership that, uh, you know, there's a, a level of, of, of forgiveness that needs to be, um, you know, cultivated within uh, from on both sides uh, of that coin. So uh, the victims, working with the victims, working with the families, as Pastor Tony had indicated, uh, it's all a part of this holistic approach of building a stronger community. Bishop, anything you want to weigh in on or possible? Um, well, there again, I think that's very important uh, because the reunification of family, at the end of the day, uh, men and women that are coming back, they're coming somewhere. And to strengthen the family, everybody wins when the family is reunited together. And that's the whole goal of it all. And, uh, and when there's a strong foundation, you know, which is the family, everything uh, blossoms from that point on. But to come back and then people not knowing how to receive the people that have hurt them, you know, releasing them, forgiving them, and then working toward restoration. You know, all these things are not gonna happen just overnight. We have to understand it's gonna be a process. And I like what Apostle said earlier, and, and unless that compassion piece is there, 
you know, the, the church sometimes can be full of judgment. And, and, you know, we stigmatize these people. They come out, they're already dealing with a thousand things. They feel like that's against them. But when we can make the journey smoother, we, we ought to do that. So there again, restoring families, restoring children, restoring if it's a husband and wife or, I mean, father, son, mother, daughter, the re a reunification of family is so important. Okay. All right. So there's no more electric hands up and we're coming toward the end. So what we're going to do is give everybody an opportunity just to share some closing thoughts uh, based upon what you heard your colleagues say, maybe something based upon what uh, a question answer, or maybe something that you want to just share. Uh, we'll back, Bishop, we just uh, started with you. So just some final thoughts in a couple of minutes on where should we go from here? Well, uh, there challenge the churches, you know, from what I've heard, across the board is that church has to do more. And we're not here, as Pastor Tony alluded to, bashing anyone, but we're saying we all got to raise the bar because at the end of the day, we're here to serve. We're serving leaders and uh, we're light and we're salt. And when Jesus saw the people that were hurting, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. And while the disciples were saying, move out the way, get out the way, Jesus says, no, sit them down, let's feed them. So we got to minister to people and, and, and not try to spiritualize everything, you know, and, you know, we got to learn to be practical again. And I want to challenge churches across the country. You got to stop taking that three and four and five offerings. And when you get through robbing and raping the people of finances, mm -hmm. let them see the impact that you're making in their community. Someone said something about young people not coming in because you're not speaking to those needs. And my last point is what Pastor Tony said, uh, put pressure on the elected officials and sit down and talk to them. If you want my vote, I want you to help us in the community. That's what we've done. Don't get in the office and then hide and not return calls, okay? Share your vision with them, okay? We're, we're concerned about restoration. If you are elected in office, we want to come and see you. We want you to come and see us, not just to get a vote. Are you concerned about helping this community? So I always say, help me help others. So God bless you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. No, oh, thank you, Bishop. Possible. God bless you. Yes, I, I just want to say thank you for this uh, auspicious occasion to come together and to share about this particular subject matter. I believe mm -hmm. that part of restoration is to look at all of the brokenness that is happening in the lives of these families that have had those that have been incarcerated. As I've said earlier, it takes the whole 360 foundation of uh, coming together and rallying around the family from the one incarcerated to everyone else that's being affected. And also as the body of Christ and as the, as the church, we have to learn how to say, Lord, if you can use anybody, here am I, send mm -hmm. me. Because we, we don't have, we're not sending enough. Uh, when I, I grew up in the church and then when we grew up, there were times where uh, many times once a week or once a month, the missionaries or either the deacons, they visited those that were incarcerated. Right. And then they came out, they didn't let them loose. They didn't turn them loose. They, they held on tight to them. And I am the product of a grandmother that when there were those that had gone to jail for drugs or whatever their, their, their crime may have been, uh, she would call them into her home and she would fry them a Southern meal. Mm. And, and, and several times uh, she, they would say to her, they said, do you know what I did? You want me to come? And she says, yes, son, sit right here. She said, we're going to eat a good meal. And she would eat a good meal with them. But while she was eating the meal, she had her Bible out and she was giving them Jesus. And we must return back to our first love. And I believe that this is the start of it. And I just thank God for each and every one of the, the panelists and respective ones here and Pastor Loudon for even spearheading and giving the invitation because I believe that from this, we should be able to birth something greater that moves through the nation because we have to tear down the systematic uh, system that is in place that marginalizes and incarcerates those that have potential. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Apostle. Pastor Ponder, where do we go from here? Yeah, well, God bless you, and, and thank you so much for this for this opportunity. Uh, we've heard a lot here uh, today. 
um, and we talk about you know challenging uh, the church. Um, I want to share with you uh, uh, something that God taught me many many years ago. Uh, and you know, some government grants are great and get money from the feds or whatever the case may be. There was a young man going back about eight years ago who uh, just was released from prison uh, from Tennessee. Uh, and he walked into our office and uh, he needed everything. He needed housing, he needed, you know, everything. So uh, I, I sat on the phone with this young man in front of my desk and I picked up the phone and I called my contact over the Department of Social Services so that we can uh, get him rental assistance, food, whatever it is that, uh, that he needed. And as I'm on hold waiting for, uh, you know, the director to get on the phone, I hear clearly from the Lord to hang up the phone. And I hung up the phone, I excused the young man from my office, and I started having this conversation with God. And God said to me, look at what it was you were just about to do. He said, you were sending this young man outside of the body of Christ for something that I've already equipped the church for. Hmm. And even if he goes there and get that, hmm. then you're helping them to have faith in that other entity instead of having faith in the kingdom of God. I really want to challenge the churches based on the conversations that we've, that we've had here in ways that, uh, as uh, the apostles said, for us to be able to birth something greater. And I believe that in order for us to birth that something greater, we need to have that book of Acts experience. When the, when the, when the disciples was in the upper room, right? Uh, waiting for you know, the day of Pentecost had come. It said that they all walked into that room and all on one accord. They didn't have different agendas. They checked all that at the door and stepped up in that room all on one accord. And because they were all on one accord, the Bible says that the spirit of God came through that room like never before. They started speaking in tongues and people thought that they were under the influence. And I believe that in order for us to birth something, that something greater to come, can you imagine if the churches across our country <laughs> checked different agendas at the door and all got on one accord to serve the people that God has entrusted us with, those who are in prison, who God loves so dearly. And if we're able to do that, churches, that's when we're going to see the Holy Spirit flow through this United States of America, and we will see a revival in our prison systems and in our communities like never before. God bless you guys, and thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. Amen. Pastor. Wow. Pastor, Tony Lowe, close Gerard, up. thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do for the kingdom of God, more importantly, all that you do for our nation. I challenge people out there to Google your name and all the great things that you've been a part of and how you continue to uh, try to shape our nation for the better. I believe that better days are ahead um, in our nation, better days are in our communities, better days in our government and better days definitely in our churches. I, I recall one day laying in a hotel getting ready to go to an event and on the news I saw a, a, a news station out of Texas where these three little boys, three black little boys who was in foster care and they did a story on these three little boys that they've been in foster care for a long time. They were 10, 12, and nine. And they wanted someone to adopt them because they did not want to separate these little boys. And I couldn't help but think about the fact that if someone don't adopt them, these three little black boys could end up in our prison systems. Because oftentimes children that go through foster care end up in our prisons because there's no family, no church, nothing. We are held accountable by our Lord and Savior for not going. I know I've you hear me all the time beating up churches. I'm only telling the truth. I, I'm not against the church. I'm just against being institutionalized and allowing the kingdom of God not be first. The Bible right. says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And what that tells me that if I go out and do his work for his people and his communities, the resources chase me and run me down. I don't chase government to say, hey, you know, do this and do that for me. When you start helping God's people, God puts you on display mm -hmm. and start lifting you up. I would have never thought in my wildest dream that a little boy from the hood of North Philadelphia 
could be chosen to be the reentry czar for the entire nation and also be the pastor for an all white church for President Jimmy Carter, serving two presidents at the same time. It's all because I still try to die to myself and put the kingdom of God on display. And then he will occupy you that you might occupy the land and that your church may make a difference in people's lives. Let's not allow another kid to go to prison. Let's not allow another community to be uh, inf infested with children killing each other over guns in street corners they don't own. Drugs and prostitution in our garden that we say we own this neighborhood. Let us rejoice and do something about it. Not just be glad, but rejoice and do something about it. Why? Because better days are ahead. If you, don't, if you don't believe that better days are ahead, go listen to that song by uh, Andrew Johnson that talks about better days, how she was alcoholic, and then she became an evangelist, all because someone introduced her to better days. We need better days in our nation. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you all for what you do. And our, those people that tuned in today, thank you so much as well. Thank you, Pastor Lowden. So, Bishop Webb, thank you so much for what you thank do. You. you know, one of the takeaways I have is when you say you've done this work for 20 years, not only are you not new to the game, but people often look at what we do or what you do in particular as church work. You actually, you're running businesses. Yes, and there's sir. a business aspect of the body of Christ that people totally overlook. So thank you for thank making you. that real. I want to go to you, Apostle Wallace. Thank you for bringing in the international perspective because there's things we can learn from other people. We're always asking people to learn something from us. Thank you also for opening up your story and talking about the reality of gunshots, not yes. overseas, here in Virginia, where yes. you are. And the fact that you're talking about 5 million tons of food, feeding the soul, but also feeding the body and the, and the areas you cover, but also reminding us about the importance of women, massive number of increase of incarcerated women, federal prison, state prison, and the children left behind. So thank you for doing the grassroots work, often overlooked uh, because you're doing the work where other people are doing the talking. I want to thank you, uh, Pastor, for the work that you're doing uh, in Nevada, for opening up your story about having been incarcerated. Not only did you use that stigma to make it a platform to work with other people, but you're walking like you're talking. You too are involved with a business and having to work with people who may not appreciate it, many who do, but also talking about the importance of what we can do for those who've been victimized and the power of forgiveness. I mean, that's a that's mm. a whole sermon in and of itself and that's not easy. Mm. Want to thank you, Tony, or Pastor Loudon for the work you're doing, as you're saying, serving two presidents simultaneously, but using public policy with a purpose. And for the work that you've done to bring education into Georgia prisons, I've had a chance to travel with you to a couple of those prisons and see it myself. And the reason we came together, going back, starting off with what I said, our founder, uh, James Hunter, when he talked about the power of getting cultural influences, which all of you are, you're at the center and using your influence so other people can change. We talk about a lot about Dr. King, we talk a lot about Rosa Parks. When Dr. King, when Rosa Parks actually found herself having to go to jail, Tony, as you mentioned, now at some point, yes, they called a lawyer, but they called King because that was a leadership moment. And when King gave his last speech, he talked about how we get divided amongst each other and how we do it. He said, when Pharaoh wanted to keep the slaves fighting against each other. He just spread rumors, let them fight against each other. But he said, when the slaves got together, that was the beginning of the end of slavery. Yes, when the Lord. church gets together, the mm. faith-based community gets together, yes. that's the beginning of the end of what we call Amen. unjust approach to criminal justice. And with that, I want to thank all of you who tuned in and listened live. I say thank you to those who are going to listen to this afterwards. Again, my name is Gerard Robinson, Vice President for the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation. Thank you so much for what all of you do and look forward to another conversation next month. God bless you. I love you guys. Thank you. God bless you.